How's it going guys? Welcome back. My name's Nick. I'm back at NT Performance Engines to hopefully finish Mel Swan's Formula Atlantic turbo motor. Um, previously we just finished the bottom end and hopefully today if we get to it we'll get the head done and hopefully get it onto the bottom end and try and complete it. So it's day two for us, for us but it's going to be like part four for you guys. And um, yeah so do you want to just give us a bit of a rundown on what it's taken to get the head to this stage. You've had like a whole heap of new buckets and stuff, haven't you? Yeah, so I'll run you through. I tore the engine down and I found that the engine had chewed up some porcelain. So that means a spark plug would come to pieces at some point in time. Uh, upon further inspection of the tear down, I did find that the big ends on the top side of the bearing were suffering from detonation. It's one of the methods that you can use as a, an engine builder to determine if the engine's been suffering from some sort of issues. Um, so I did see detonation on the bearings and the spark plug had been eaten up at some point that chewed up spark plugs. So the porcelain had come to pieces and the strap had been eaten by the engine. You do find that in your exhaust valves uh, on the faces and the seats, damage going of the porcelain being smashed between the valve face um, of the valve and then the seat. Uh, these had beryllium, this has beryllium copper seats in it. Uh, and then another thing that I found was this is a spark plug that we removed. And if you have a look at it, this is called a surface discharge spark plug. So it's got no strap. The porcelain is very protected, um, so it's very unlikely that these spark plugs will come apart. Um, but I don't like I don't like really using surface discharge. Um, I normally just go for like an iridium style plug uh, on a turbo application like this. Um, somewhere around the seven heat range is pretty good. Um, but yeah, like you say, we've found some issues with the cylinder head, so it's got a whole new valve train valves. Uh, valve springs, buckets, retainers, circlips, uh, camshafts. So the entire valve train has been replaced in this engine. It was suffering huge valve float. Um, so we've addressed that issue by replacing all the valve train in it and converting it over from a shim under bucket system to a solid. So it has no shims anymore. Uh, and in doing so, we've also dropped the camshaft profile out of it as well. We've gone from a TRD camshaft, which is about 310 degrees or something, uh, and some phenomenal amount of lift. I haven't even bothered checking them, and we can check that today. Uh, and then I've gone back to a Kelford uh, 272, 280 degree camshaft, which is good for about 9,000 RPM in the power curve, where we're gonna just ramp up and plateau at about 9,000. We don't wanna rev it any harder because of the gearbox that we're using this car, wants to be shifting at about 8.6. Yep. So uh, that's sort of the, you know, that's sort of where we're at. Um, also, we've gone from a bigger turbine down to a smaller turbine, uh, something similar to what I'm running on my car now. Um, and I know for a fact that on a 1.6 litre, that turbine can make, you know, four to 600 horsepower pretty easily. But we'll see what it does on the day and uh, we'll get into the engine. But um, today we're basically going to re-clearance the cylinder head. I've got all these new buckets here. Um, so these are different sizes to correct all the sizes that I have currently in here. If you come over here, Nick, you'll see my, my sizes that were in there for the Kelfords that I have now. It's a bit crude how it all looks. But at the end of this, they'll be all within one thou of each other. I do have to pull out two exhaust valves, uh, two intake valves, I think. And I have to tip the valves down a little bit more, about two thou on each valve. So you'll get to see that process. Um, and just because I couldn't get the buckets to put those in a range that suited me. So tip those few down, put the, the, put the other buckets in, re-clearance ahead, make sure that's all correct. And then we'll go through and smack it on the bottom end. So yeah. you'll get to see the uh, head gasket and firing system, how that's all glued on. Um, any tips and tricks you can pick up there to uh, do it yourself. Um, but yeah, we'll go through and we'll just get working. Excellent. Yeah, you hit like turbo or something, didn't you? Yeah, it's turbo as well. That thing's psycho. All right, so what I normally do here is, yep, got clearance on that. So you just give it a tap, then you hear that knock. That's your, that's your clearance. Get some brake clean on this on a fresh what, rag. What did you have, like a, a magnet on the bucket? Yeah, just magnet magnet on the bucket. And, and you just sort of, you just lift the bucket. Yeah. And I can hear that there's clearance under that. So that's just the first sign. It's just an easy thing to do before you chuck a, a um, feeler gauge under it. And then the other thing too is the loudness. I've got to a point now where I can hear how loud it is. And then I go, oh, that's probably going to be about 12, 12 okay. to 14 thou. So but I can't say that now because I already know my clearance and I've got a correction, so I know I'm gonna be in the ballpark anyway. Yeah. But let's just start at six. Six goes in easy. Seven, easy. Eight. 
Easy. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Here we go. Beautiful resistance on two. That's thirteen. Bit easy on one. So. 14 doesn't go in. Oh, it does if you force it. So that's 13.5. So we've got 13.5 and 13. So that's good. That's where I wanted it. So you would have seen me, I would have cycled the head over once I finished it a few times. Yep. And that's just to get the buckets moving, get the valves moving, get everything seated once it's all sort of, you've got to do a few rotations, you can't just bolt the cam down and start doing it. Um, do a few cycles and then check your, check your lash. So now I'll just start again. That sounds very similar, so it's probably going to be, I reckon just out of hearing it, that's probably going to be about 14, that's probably going to be about 13. So I'll just step right up to start at 10. So 10. 11, 12, they're starting to give resistance. 13, that's a bit tight, so it's about 12 and a half. That doesn't go in at all, so that's 12 and a half and 12. Not bad, so our tolerance is within one thou at the moment. Let's keep moving. But my tolerance is closer. I yep. think I was in the yours 10, is, yours 10 is tighter. So yours is shimmed, so it's easier to fix yours. This this is this is a solid bucket which I can get buckets for, but the ranges are a bit tighter on this. Um, I've also loosened this right up because it has brilliant seats, so okay. chances are they're going to sink. Okay. So if I give it a bit extra, it's going to sink, and I'm still going to have clearance. If this loses all of that, I'm screwed. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I want to give it a bit extra. It is also is turbocharged. Yeah. A lot more heat. A lot more heat. Yeah. yeah so. Um, yeah, I'm going to uh, also run a bit of extra slop in a turbo setup versus an aspirated setup. Yours is producing substantially less heat, so I'm going to give it a lot tighter clearances. And the benefit of that is you get more lift. Mm -hmm. You're just talking nothing. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Very minute amounts of lift, but yeah. it's power. Like, so if I can make it a bit easier. 13, so that's 12. No, it's, um, it's funny how you say more lift, but awesome. I remember you were saying when you were doing my motor that you've seen you've seen engines that have been shimmed by other machine shops where the valves are visibly like different heights when they were on full lift. Yeah. It's because of the way they were shimmed. So it is like, you know, if you, you, got to, you kind of want to get it right, especially in like a race application. I've seen it where machine shops have machined the valves and when they sit in the cylinder head, yeah. as they sit, the valves are noticeably different. So yeah. the valve cut is higher and lower and then you think to yourself, okay, well, if the valves are sitting in different positions, what, what's my seated pressure difference? If I've got a half a mil of seated pressure difference, did they put that spring on a tester and then test to see how much valve spring they've lost between yep. two valves? So that wasn't a shim, that was more the cut of the valve. There was a cut on the yeah. valve, on the seat. Okay. And then if, I mean, I've also seen this too, they've gone, oh shit, those valves don't sit right. Then they've faced a valve to try and make it look the same, but then you've still lost that spring pressure because it's sitting completely wrong. So... Yep. Um, I use a new and BB on this machine. Uh, sorry, no, a new and contour, uh, contour, contour BB. Yeah, new and contour BB, which is like a CNC valve profiler. So it's a single point cutter that you can actually program into the CNC and cut exactly how many cuts you want. So this could have a 20 valve, what do you call it? A 20 point valve cut. So like, you know how they yeah. talk about three angle valve yeah, cut. Yeah, this yeah. could have 20 in it. If but you wanted, yeah. Realistically, this has only got about three because you only really need your top cut, your, your actual face, and then the throat, and then yep. the throat, I just put that, push that right out to the seat so you get maximum flow. Right. Um, it's not an aspirator motor, it's turbo, so the faster you can get the air in there, the better it's gonna work. Like, people have got their own theories, and the YouTube guys are gonna be like, oh, you don't know, what whatever, man, like, come and race me, and we'll see who wins. <laughs> like, so, oh, okay, so we've got, that's a tight 13, so it's 12.5. 4, 5, and 13. Here we go, guys. So that's our correct machine size. So between 12 and 13 and a half. So that's pretty good. So 
you can actually see how much valves coming out. Yeah. Remember yours, the valve head was completely the, well, all the way out. Right. But so. these ones are visibly bigger than mine. Yeah. The valves are physically bigger. Yeah. yeah. So if you come over, you can see them beryllium seats up under there. Everything's covered in oil. So that's why it looks green. Then if you look down through the port, you can obviously see the openage. Yeah, so CNC port job. It's wide open. Yeah, that's full lift on the valve, so I can't, it'd be unreal to see what the TRDs would have looked in there because their profile is just yeah, it's massive, next level. Yeah. massive. But unfortunately, for the amount of boost that it was running in the RPM, it was getting substantial valve float, so not good. So what I do, guys, if you follow any sort of book, they'll tell you where to position the camshaft and the procedure to undo the cam. What I do is I set these lobes on overlap. So the lobes are currently sitting like this on overlap. So these, these four valves are open. If you look down through the port, you can see that the valves are open evenly. Might be so hard to see on camera. This is just my method of taking a camshaft out fast because I'm doing it so much. So at this point in time, there's no risk in me undoing these back caps because there's no lift on this cam. So it's not like anything's forcing the cam up beyond any point. So I can do this cap here, loose. There's a fast way to take a cam out because these cams have been in and out of this head at multiple times. So these caps you can basically pull completely off and I'll just show you. Very low risk in this method of taking a camshaft out. That's something you figure out when you do enough cams. It's confirmed there's no lift there. Yeah, no lift. And then you can see it. the valve load, the lobes yeah, are up here. Up so here. it's on, yeah. yeah, it's on base circle. So then what you do is you do your thrust. Because if you undo the camshaft, let's just say you undo the camshaft and this valve here is on full lift and you undo all these caps, but leave the thrust, the camshaft will snap through here because yeah. it's, it's bound up on the thrust. So you just remove the thrust. Remove the thrust cap first. That stops it from binding up on the thrust as you remove. Now you start on these four, so you crack them. So you do, I don't know, what's that quarter turn on all four. Then now they're loose, they're cracked. Then you just go one, two, one, two, one, two. And you just repeat the process and the cam comes up nice and slow. At a certain point in time, the valves will hit the seats and then there'll be no load on them. So there's a little bit, so you can just see a little bit of light through them. So there's still a little bit of pressure on this cam. So just start the process again. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And just come back through. And again, we're coming up on the thrust, so it's not bound on the thrust. There you go, so the cam's now loose. That's it. Undo the caps. And we're loose. That's an easy way to take a camshaft out fast, guys. It's a bit of a process, so if you have to watch the video twice to get that, do it because these cams are hollow. The oil is fed through the center front journal. I'm oh, sorry, the, the front journal. And then the oil is fed through there and then goes through a hollow gun drilled shaft. That's a plug. So these are hollow. So what happens is the oil goes through and then comes out of each of these holes on each journal. And then it trickles out to the side of the bucket where it's pool inside here and then that lubricates the lobes. So... Toyota shafts are very brittle, especially cast. Um, because of the casting, they're, they're prone to crack. So these are very strong when they're radially twisted. I've seen videos of guys like smacking them and they snap um, other YouTubers and stuff. They're not designed to be used as a, a belting tool. They're designed to spin and open and operate buckets. So used correctly, these will, will work and last. But if you try and undo it and you bind up on the thrust, you will snap it. So be gentle with these things. So. This is now confirmed to be the right size and clearance. So what I'm gonna do is put my buckets, my caps back on, slide some paper in to hold the buckets in the position so they don't fall out and get lost. Move over to the exhaust side. And in this side, we have to modify two tip heights of these two valves. So we're gonna bring the head over to my head assembly bench. I'm gonna pull two valves out and I'm gonna show you how I tip them down. Cool. Okay. So what we'll do guys, is we'll just open the valve, collets out, put my collets in there. Release the valve, 
valve spring out just to get him out of the way. Move the head out of the way. Valve out. That's our valve. Nice big valve. I'm going to clean him off. Bit of brake clean. I did do a video on this on my Facebook page, which has been getting a few likes here and there. Um, I don't know if I've done it on Insta, but... I, I haven't actually seen it, but just to um, just to remind everyone what we're doing here, you're, gonna, you're getting this valve out to re-tip it. To... Yeah, so what's, what's happening now is we don't have enough clearance on the last two lobes. This is the smallest bucket I can get in my shimless size. So what happens is if you put the valve into, inside the bucket like that, what you can see is there's a, there's a set height between the face and the, and the, and the, the top of the bucket there, the, the face of the bucket. So if I don't have the clearance between here and the base circle of the cam, there's only one thing I can do and is remove material from here. And then that gives me my clearance between here and the cam lobe. So yep. because this is solid, the shim is a part of the, of the bucket. So there's no shim, it's that's solid. And these come in predetermined sizes. So I'm at the smallest range of what I can actually use. So the only thing left that I can do is tip the top of the valve off. And we don't need to take much. We've only got to take on this valve. We're at seven. And on seven, we needed to take off. Well, we can see it here. We're at 13 thou and I want to be at 16. So I need to take three thou off. So we'll come across to here. This is my intricate machinery station. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up my dial gauge, which is in inches. I'll set that at the top so it makes it a bit easier for everyone to see. Now what I'll do is I'll just bring that up until it's at zero. It's going to make it a little bit harder, but we'll get there. So you're setting all this on like a large stone that's completely flat too? Yeah, so the stone that I'm working on here, this is a granite stone made for um, sharpening Japanese knives and things. I picked it up from a... Um, uh, what was it like a Japanese tool store or something? The guy bought four or five of them, paid like a thousand dollars each for these bloody stones, and then no one bought them. So they've been sitting in his workshop for I don't know how long. He said years, and he said, "Do you want?" When I bought oil stones, because I use oil stones to um, deck surfaces and stuff, make sure surfaces are flat. Um, so I use Japanese knife sharpening stones, um, and then I said, "What's that thing in that?" And it was coming in this timber box. This is from Japan. It's crazy expensive. Um, and it weighs, oh man, it's so very heavy. But he offered it to me for about $20. He wow. goes, just do you want it? And, he, and I go, how much do you want for it? What's that thing worth? And he goes, he goes, cover the shipping. And I was like, what's the shipping? He goes, each stone cost me $20 in shipping. And that's because he bought over a lot of bulk material in a container. So he broke the cost down until he found out what it cost him for shipping. And he and basically got it for nothing. Wow. So, yeah. So this, um, you can lap on this, you can, you know, sharpen knives. I've sharpened some knives here at home on it. Um, but yeah, so I use it for jobs like this. So I'll show you what we're, where we're at. So we're using the face of the valve as a datum. So the face of this valve is a zero point. And what we do is we measure the overall height of the valve. So if I come down and put this on the tip of the valve, you can see that we're at 40. So what I'll do is I'll just come around and make it zero. Okay, so if I move the tip of the valve around the face of the dial gauge, it stays at zero. So that's my zero point. Now what I need to do is I need to take material off that until I see a drop in three thou. So to make this repeatable, I'll make it exactly zero because it's just off. So that's where we're at, that's zero, you can see that. So what I'll do is I'll lift the gauge up, come down. Now it doesn't go back to zero because it's not on the valve. So we're we're actually using the dial gauge. You've got to give it a little bit of pressure. So what I'll do is I'll lift this up, put the valve under it, and come back. Where does it go back to? Right on zero. Basically, it's just under, but that's that could be me touching this, you know what I mean? So what you do is you just make it, test that it's repeatable, take the valve off, move the valve around, come back. Where is it? Just under zero, same as before. So now we know what our zero point is. If I take three thou off that, three thou comes off which gives us our extra clearance so what i'll do is i'll get my here i've got my um ring file and i need to get the stone that i use for tipping valves all right guys so this ring file serves two jobs 
files rings and then in this little spot here you can actually put your valve in here and then face the valve so tip the valve so I bought this from America it's from a company called Goodson there's the company there if you want to buy one yourself these are this is just a replacement stone so I bought this one with a stone and then I bought a replacement stone to do valve tips and then obviously this one does valve uh, sorry ring face yeah, rings and stuff so piston rings. Yeah. I'll get my clamp clamp this down to the bench Cool, that's solid. So it's you're just using that, that other stone just because it's not it's not worn out, it's flat. Yeah, the, yeah. the wear in this is, is um, yeah. puts it right on the tip of where the ring has been wearing on the stone. Yeah. This stone is damaged. Like you can see that the ring falls into this groove here. This needs to be replaced. I haven't done a set of rings in a little while now, um, but um, that doesn't definitely does need to be replaced. But the idea is the fresh stone just gonna it's gonna make it a lot a lot oh, more even for just your, works yeah, out for yeah. that stone because that stone i've kept just for valve tipping so the tips yeah. of the valve stay in the same spot because of that groove on the stone yeah there's other machines you can buy this is by far the cheapest I'm, I'm not ready to invest thousands of dollars in a machine that just tips valves you know so this is a especially because i've got uh, a machine shop that i can utilize i've tipped all these valves already i just didn't tip these two enough yeah so and I'm sure this sort of thing that would take a little bit of practice to get it right, a bit of skill involved. Yeah, it's a little bit, like you say, you just go slow and I'm just going to go slow, take off a little bit at a time because I don't want to take off too much. In saying that, I've still got a mad, uh, I've got a, a good uh, variation of uh, tolerance that I can go to. So if I take a half a thou too much or even a thou, it doesn't affect it. Yep. It's still in a good range. So you can see this stone has only just been used for valve tips because it's wear just there, but none on this side. So I'm probably gonna run on the fresh side. This engine deserves it. Sweet. Okay, so, what I was saying to Nick off camera a little bit earlier is, what we'll do is you run the valve tip around the outside of the valve and you look for deviation on your gauge, and then you run it through the center on a few, direc a few directional planes. There's no high spots, that's exactly zero all the way around. So I'm going to do, take the pressure off, double check it one last time before it goes, zero, okay, so let's do this, I've got three thou to come off, let's start by just taking a few grinds off this, it's a really hard valve, there's an Inconel valve, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard to machine off, so we'll, we'll give it a go, press down on here, hear it grinding, Okay, so now we have a look at the tip of the valve. We can see there's a directional pattern of machining. A bit of metal coming off there. So we'll just clean it off. Let's take a look. Let's see how much we took. What's the bet it took next to nothing? <laughs> Probably very high. One thou. Sweet. So there's a little bit of deviation because of the machine grooves on that. So we'll fix that. So we took off one thou guys, so we're going to go through and take get our three thou off. So the direction of the grain is this way, so I'm just going to rotate it 90 degrees. Rotate it against the grain. Alright, so I took a bit more off there. Three there, three there, about two and a half there, three there, two there. So on this side it's a little bit low, that's what we'll do. Little trick, bit of worn out bit of sandpaper. So you're just going to focus on the side that you want to even out? Now what I'll do is I'll just, it could, that could be a high spot like of the machining, I so see. like okay. of the actual, so what I'll do is if I just get a little bit of sand, worn out sandpaper that needs to be like pretty not abrasive, Yeah. and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get rid of any sort of high spots on it with the sandpaper, 
So I'll just run the, so I'm running the sandpaper on the chamfer as well, just to get rid of any sort of like um, high spots or uh, what do you call it? Burrs. So get rid of any burrs. So I've machined nothing off that. I'm I've just smoothened out the tip with a bit of sandpaper. Let's go back and check it, see what she does. Okay, here we go. So three thou. It's about a thou of variation. Oh no, I've fallen off the valve, that's why. Okay, so here we've got two and a half. Come across, we've got three there. Got about two and a half there. Come across and we've got two and a half there. So it's looking at about two and a half, three. So I'm just gonna push this in lightly. Just take the final cut, not trying to take any material off, just get a nice sort of finish on the end of it. So very lightly. Just gonna rotate it over with my back fingers here. That should have taken off any high spots we had. Let's see what we can do. Looks pretty good. Three. About a half a thou variation. Before it goes over. That's actually moving the dial gauge. So when it's actually hitting some of the high spots, you can see how the dial gauge deflects. It's actually hitting some of my tooling marks. So it's probably actually flat. It is probably a little bit rough. I'm just gonna sit down on the top of it. Get rid of any high spots. Okay. Three. It's pretty good. Fell off there. Three. Very nice. Yeah. There we go. So it took off exactly what I wanted to, guys. So unfortunately, you can't trust exactly what this is doing. So I guarantee you, I'm going to put this thing back in. And I know that I've got 13th hour and I've taken three, which has ended me up my 16. What's the bet that it's not going to be 16 exactly? It's going to be 15.8 or something. And what's, um, what do you think the variable, just because it's such a tight uh, measurement, is it oil You've or? You've just got so much going on. There's slop in the bucket. So as the bucket sits in this hole, that's got play. Okay. So as the lobe comes over, it canters the bucket over. And okay. when it's on full lift, if, if the cam lobe is not dead square on it and it's just over by a few degrees, that pushes the bucket sideways, which then sits on this cocked. And then yep. that pushes, like it's just, there's always a little bit of variation. But like you say, mate, if you've got the clearance here, it doesn't matter, you need something. As long as you've got something, it doesn't matter, which we learnt with yours. We, they closed up a little bit, so we had to just reshim Yeah, reshim them, yeah. This makes it a little bit more difficult when you go to a shimless, um, shimless yeah. because you've just got to know what buckets were in there. So in my book there, I've calculated the bucket sizes, my corrections, and I record those. So if there's any ever issue when someone calls me up and says, I have a, I have a tight cylinder, or tight valve rather, and I go, what's the clearance? They tell me the clearance. They basically pull the cam cover off, check it. They measure it and they, I get them to write it down the same as this in inches. And then they call me back and they go, I've sent you the photo. I look at it and I go, okay, we've got a problem with that valve. Something's happening. There's, there's, the seat is sinking. The valve is starting to cup where the valve actually starts to, if this is the valve phase, it starts to buckle under the valve spring pressure pulling on okay. it. Yep. So when the valve starts to cup and buckle, then the valve goes in. So that reduces your clearance. When that starts to happen, there's a few things you can do. You can give it extra clearance, and if it moves again, stop the motor, she's gonna hurt. So, um, you know, and we've done that with yours. I started to hear a misfire, I was like, something's wrong here. So we checked it, no clearance, and, um, you know, corrected it. Yep. If it moves again, the cylinder head's coming off. We're gonna sort of start out. looking yeah. for an issue, yeah. When you start running such heavy valve spring pressure like this, we're running a twin spring Supertech, you start to really pull some spring pressure on these things, and you know, the spring is pulling quite hard on this valve. So it is gonna to start to stretch the valve. It's gonna, you know, we're gonna have issues. So you've gotta stay on top of maintenance when yeah. it comes to an engine like this. For sure. Um, all right, so we're at a position now where we'll just give it a light clean with some brake clean. 
getting the swarf and shit off it. I've used that rag for swarf, so that's ruined. Fresh rag. All right, guys, and we'll give it some oil. So I oil the stem. So I oil the stem, run the oil around. Then with the excess oil on my fingers, I run that around the valve face. If you're gonna be building an engine that might be sitting around for a few months whilst the engine goes into the car and then gets fabricated, things like that, always oil the face of the valve when you install it because the nickel seat and sitting against this steel valve or whatever material valve you've got, you'll get rust between the two because you're gonna get moisture, it's gonna happen, it's gonna get between the two surfaces, it will rust and that will damage the valve and the seat face. Uh, for any period of time that you're, you're building the car. So I recommend just oil the hell out of the valves because it doesn't matter. As soon as you start this engine, the oil burns off in about half a second. So it's not enough oil to hurt the engine. So we're gonna chuck that back in. Valves in, spring in. Get these collets ready. So I use a magnet tip screwdriver, put my collet against it. What I'll do is I'll run this valve down, pressure the valve up. Stick the valve face on there. Done, one valve done, come over. Undo the second, rinse and repeat, guys. Oh. How funny would it be if it was exactly the same? Yeah. All this fucking work. What the fuck? I took the valve tip off and it's still the same size. So it was 13, 14 before. So we'll start at 13, see where she ends up. 13, easy. 14, easy. 15, easy. 16. Bit of resistance, bit of resistance. 17. Nope. So it's, oh, ah. that's 16 and a half. 16 Bit of resistance there. I'd say it's just over 16 and a half. So I'm gonna call it 16 and a half, 16 and a half. Exactly what you wanted. Pretty much, yeah. Sweet. Let's chuck it on, chuck it on the block. That's good, happy with that. Okay, put the valve machine away. I thought that would take a lot longer. So that'd be it for this video guys. If you liked the video, be sure to like, comment and subscribe. And hit that notification bell if you'd like to see part five where Matt shares the secrets behind the copper head gasket and firing system. And we finally get that head on. Thanks for watching guys, see you next time.